ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter number 3, if you're not there already, and uh, we'll look at verse number 16, and before we read, I want us to uh, be thinking about a gift. What is the best gift that you have ever received? When we think about Christmas time, uh, uh, a lot of people focus on the gifts that they get at Christmas, right? We think, uh, I was doing some research for the sermon, and, uh, and I was looking it up and it said 35% of Americans go at least $1,000 in debt to be able to provide presents for their families. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. We think about the greatest gift that we could ever receive was a gift given by God. Uh, a gift that cost God everything and cost us nothing. What an amazing gift. Uh, we think about the, the gifts that we've been given over the years. The most important gift that we could ever receive, though, is the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Grab your Bibles and turn to John 3.16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father God, as we dive into your word this morning, we think about the greatest gift that was ever given. God, a gift that cost everything. But God, it's a free gift to us, and there's no strings attached, there's no fine print. God, it's a gift that was freely given by you so that we could have eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Be with us this morning as we dive into your word and bless our time together. In Jesus' name pray. Amen. The first thing I want us to look at this morning is the giver of the gift. The Bible says, for God, every gift has both a giver and a receiver, right? That's how gift giving works. You get a gift, and you give a gift, or you receive a gift. And so uh, here we see that the giver of this gift is God. This is the same God who is all powerful, uh, he's omnipresent, he is everywhere at one time. This God gave us a gift, and all we have to do is accept the gift. Romans 5, 8 says this, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God gave us His love. He, he gave us every bit of love that He had for us. God paid the highest price for the greatest gift we could have received. What an amazing God that we have. The reason for the gift, I think it's important that uh, we, we give gifts for reasons, right? Whether it be a Christmas gift or a birthday gift or a just because gift. Every gift has a reason. You say, what was the reason for the gift that God gave us? It was His love. For God so loved the world. The world who was an enemy of Him. A world uh, that, that had turned their back on God. God still gave His own Son freely. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says this, And this was manifested in the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son to the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the payment in full for our sins. What was the motivation for the gift that God gave us? It was His love for us. While we were enemies of God, God loved us so much that He gave us His Son. I'm thankful that the Bible tells us that He gave the gift for the whole world. There was nobody that was left out. How many of you have ever heard an ad for something in it? And you, you read this ad and you're like, man, this is a really good deal. And you, whether it be your phone company or, or your internet, and you're reading all through the ad. And at the very bottom of the ad, you know, you've read all the good details and you get this for this much, and you get to the bottom of the ad, and it says, for new customers only. Come on, man. You tricked me into reading this whole ad, and now because I've been a customer for so long, uh, there's this fine print that says, for new customers only. Hey, guess what? There is no fine print when it comes to the love of God and the gift that He gave us. You're not going to get to the bottom and it says, uh, you can have this free gift unless you've done this, or unless you've been here, or unless you act this way. There is no fine print when it comes to the gift that God has given us. The gift has no stipulations and is for every person in the world. Romans 2.11 says this, for there is no respect of persons with God. God doesn't <coughs> care about, about where you're from. God doesn't care about how much money is in your bank account. God doesn't care about any of those things. What God cares about is that He gave His Son for you, and you can accept Him. Amen. The gospel of the good news is for every man. 
Salvation doesn't depend on the color of your skin, the amount of money in your bank account, or even the house that you live in. Salvation is for every man because the free gift was offered by a God who doesn't care, has no respect for persons. Think about the gift that was given. Every gift that we give costs us something, right? It costs us whether we go to the Dollar Tree, we go to Walmart, we go to Amazon, where we get the gift from, it's going to cost us some money. We think about the gift that God gave. The, God, the gift that God gave cost Him His only begotten Son. His only Son. Jesus, who was there with His Father in creation, He was called in the book of Revelation, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world was freely given by God to be a sacrifice for our salvation. Think about that for a minute. God gave His only Son. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I think about my only Son right now, David, to be honest, I, I probably could not give him up for you guys. I'm sorry. But I'm not God. But God took his only son, sent him to earth in the, in the most humble form as a baby, where he lived a sinless life for 33 and a half years, was sent to a cross, uh, a cross that he didn't deserve, a cross that was my cross for sins that I had committed. And he took that cross freely. And he died on that cross. He shed his blood for you and I. He was buried and rose again three days later. What an amazing God we serve who gave that gift for us. Isaiah 9, 6 says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's Jesus. What a, what a great God we serve. This promise comes all the way back in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, in verse number 15, where God promises us a Messiah. Genesis 3.15 says this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan thought he had won the allegiance of the woman, but instead God put enmity between Satan and the woman, meaning that God had made Satan the enemy of the human race. Satan thought he had won. He thought he had destroyed the perfect world that God had created. But in while sin did do that, there is coming a day when this prophecy would be fulfilled. The first time this prophecy was fulfilled was when Jesus Christ came as a baby. The woman has no seed outside of the man. So this would prophesy the miraculous conception of Jesus. Where he would not inherit a sin nature because our sin nature comes from our dad. Right? So this was prophesying a virgin birth. Because the, the sin comes from our father. Remember, sin came into the world through the first Adam and it was, it was erased by the second Adam. One commentator said this, he would not inherit the sin nature which would disqualify every son of Adam from becoming a savior from sin. The prophesied thus clearly anticipates the future virgin birth of Christ. Jesus came. He was born of a virgin. And he lived a perfect life so that he could be the sacrifice for sin. The last part of the prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus went to the cross. But it would be ultimately fulfilled when Jesus cast Satan into the lake of fire. Satan has thought he's won over and over and over. We read throughout the whole New or the whole Old Testament how Satan thought every time that he took someone out of the bloodline that he had won, he had defeated, there would be no Messiah, but God's plans are were way higher than his plans. There, there was nothing that, he, that Satan could do to disrupt the plan that God had already established. The plan that God had, had had before the world even began. Before Adam sinned, God had a plan. Think about that. And God still made us. Knowing he would have to give his only son. When God sent his son as a free gift, he paid for the sins of the world. The past, the present, and the future sins. And all we have to do is accept the gospel. There is no fine print. Can we think about the recipient of the gift? The recipient of the gift. The Bible says, whosoever believeth in him. I'm thankful for the whosoever's in the Bible, aren't you? Whosoever means anyone or any person. There is no one that's left out. You must believe in Jesus and the finished work of the cross. Jesus came as a baby. He lived a sinless life. 
He died on the cross, was buried, and three days later He arose from the grave, thus becoming the payment in full for our sins. There was no other sacrifice. See, we think about the Old Testament sacrificial system, and what, what was the point of it? It was paying forward the sins. It was, it was deferring the payment for another year, deferring the payment for another year, deferring the payment for another year. When Jesus Christ came to the earth and, and died and shed His blood, it paid all of those sins. There was no more need for sacrifice because Jesus Christ was the final sacrifice. There was no more need for another sacrifice. In 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is laid out for us. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I'm thankful that we don't have to worry about man's uh, philosophy and man's uh, history. No, we have the very plan that God had laid out, and, and it's lasted for, for 6,000 years. Think about that. It's, it's not an old truth. No, it's a timeless truth. It's a truth that will never expire. To be saved, you must believe in the gospel. It doesn't matter what you have done in your past. The gift is still yours, uh, and it's still there for you. All you have to do is believe in the gospel. Paul dealt with this a little bit in 1 Corinthians. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. First Corinthians chapter number six, verse number nine. Here Paul is reminding them of some things. And we all need a good reminder every now and then of our past. It reminds us of where we came from and how God has changed our life. Look at verse number nine of First Corinthians six. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That's true, isn't it? All of us are unrighteous before Christ. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's a list, isn't it? He's saying all of these things, if you've done any of these things, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But then read verse number 11. And such were some of you. How many of you can raise your hand and say that you weren't perfect before you got saved? All of us. None of us were perfect before we got saved. None of us uh, could ever be perfect. Even, uh, even the smallest child is not perfect because it's been marred by sin. And so here Paul is reminding them, hey, uh, all of these things that I've just listed, none of these people can inherit the kingdom of God, but God has changed the name tag on your nameplate. You're no longer an adulterer. You're no longer a family. You're no longer abusing yourself with mankind. You're no longer any of these things because Jesus Christ has bought you with a price. Amen. He said, and such were some of you. Think about where we were before salvation. We're wicked. Say, I wasn't that bad. No, we were that bad, I promise. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stole? Have you ever done any of those things? All of us have done all of those things. So I'm not a murderer. Well, have you ever hated someone? Because Jesus said that if you hate someone in your heart, it's the same thing as murdering them on the outside. The Bible says, and such were some of you. But. But what? You're washed. But. You're sanctified. But you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. While well, Satan tries to remind us of our past, but God, right? But God. God has changed our life. He's changed our name. While, while the world tries to remind us what we were, we can step forward knowing that Jesus Christ has replaced all of that and He's covered all of those things with His blood. When God sees our name, He no longer sees Cody Jones. He sees Jesus Christ paid in full. We can try all we want to work for our salvation. 
We can, want, we can try all we want to do good things and to give to the poor and to give to the church and to be in church every service and to wear the right clothes and to do all of the right things. But if, if Jesus Christ hasn't replaced your name with His, it doesn't matter. Jesus has paid in full our sins. We just have to accept the gift. Aren't you thankful that the Bible doesn't say something like whosoever unless you fill in the blank? Because all of us will be disqualified. Think about some more of the whosoever's in the Bible. Romans 10, 13 says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 4, 14 says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Over and over and over, Jesus has, has given us this theme of the whosoever's in the Bible. And I'm thankful that I'm part of the whosoever's and you can be too. All of these are great reminders that anyone who trusts the gospel can be saved. So did the contents of the gift. Back over in John chapter number 3. The contents of the gift. The Bible says that we should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting means lasting or enduring forever. Eternal, existing or continuing without end. While we come to the end of our life, our life does not have to end at our death. Right? That is when our life begins. Uh, our eternal life with Jesus Christ. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But that only matters if you're saved. If you're not saved, to be absent from the body means that you're in the presence of Satan. You are in an eternal hell, burning forever and ever and ever. There's only two destinations at the end of this life. There's not three or four or five or six. No, there's two destinations. We don't die and just go into an abyss, right? No, we die and we go to heaven and we go to hell. There's no in between. And we have, a, we have an obligation, we have a choice to, to make when it comes to our, our eternal life. Think about the gifts that we receive. Most gifts we receive don't last super long depending on what it is, right? How many of you have ever gotten food as a gift? Food only lasts as long as you allow it to last. I got some sweets from some people at Chick-fil-A and... They did not last very long, right? So that, that gift only lasted as long as it would. Think about money. Money only lasts as long as you allow it to last, right? You can make a dollar go a long way, not anymore. But you used to be able to make a dollar go a long way. And you think, now uh, that money comes in and that money goes out. That's just how it is. Think about stuff. Stuff only lasts as long as you don't use it very often, right? They don't make things the way they used to. But the gift that God has for us is eternal. It never rusts, it never corrupts, it never runs out. There is no, uh, it, it's not like food, we're never, in, we're never lack anything. It's, it's not like money. And God owns the cattle on the thousand hills. We, we could never run out. Uh, it's not about our stuff because this, when we, do, when we put it up, it, it doesn't matter because it doesn't rust or corrupt or, or any of those things. The gift that God gave us is an eternal one. Once you receive the gift, it doesn't expire, and you can't lose it. Aren't you thankful for that? I remember one year I got a Bass Pro gift card for, my, for either my birthday or Christmas. $50 Bass Pro gift card. And I thought, man, I can buy a lot, of, a lot of tackle with that. And so I get that, I put it in my pocket, then I'm going throughout the day, and I lose my $50 Bass Pro gift card. I was not very happy. And so I went through a lot of trouble to get that $50 gift card back. Right? But God's gift isn't like that. You don't, you don't put it in your pocket and lose it. Right? How many of you ever put something in your pocket and lost it? And lost it forever. It didn't come back. Thankfully, after months and months and months of haggling with Bass Pro Shops, I got my $50 gift card back. But that's not how it always is. Sometimes we put something in our pocket, you know, a dollar, twenty dollars, whatever, and we drop it because we pull out our phone or pull out our wallet and it's gone forever. The gift that God has given us is not like that. We can never lose it. The Bible says that no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. 
They can try. They, and, and, and there's a lot of people who believe that they can lose their salvation. But I'm thankful today to know without a shadow of a doubt that the salvation that I've received as a 12-year-old boy is never going to run out of, 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 of grace. It's never going to run out of mercy. It's never going to run out of, uh, of everlasting life. Because the life that God has given us, the gift that He has given us, is lasting forever and ever and ever. John 14, 1 through 4 says this, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Think about the promise that God has given us. God has promised eternal life. He's promised us a home in heaven. He's promised us a mansion. And He's prepared a place for us. And He says, if it were not so, I, would have, I wouldn't have told you that this was true. Think about Jesus. We can lie, right? It's easy for us to lie. But Jesus, it's impossible. It's against His very nature to lie. And so if Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, He wasn't lying. He is preparing a place for us, uh, even today. God has promised us life after the sinful world we live in, and all we have to do is accept the free gift that He has given. Let's look at verse number 17 of John chapter number 3. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. The world was condemned when Adam ate of the fruit that he wasn't supposed to eat of. The world was already condemned. So Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. No. Look what it says. It says, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. We were already condemned. He came so that the world could be saved. Verse number 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, and they are wrought in God. The world we live in loves darkness. They, they deter the light. They, they try to go as far away from the light as they can. When someone comes in the room and with the light switch on, what is the first thing they're trying to do? They're trying to turn the light switch off. Jesus is that light. He came so that the world not be condemned but be saved. And all we have to do is accept the free gift that He's given us. In conclusion this morning, all of us have an opportunity to accept the free gift that God has offered us. It's simple. The Bible lays it plainly. How to get this free gift. You don't have to haggle with the salesman. Right? You don't have to buy anything to get this gift. Just have a couple questions for us this morning. Is there been a time in your life when you accepted this gift? If not, today's the day. There's no other time. The, the only moment that we're promised is right now. We, we could leave today and never, never come back to a church again. We could leave today and never have another opportunity to hear the gospel. Today is the only day that we have. What better Christmas gift than an eternal gift? A gift that will last forever. Let's all stand for the first invitation. Remember 123 after we pray. Father God, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to be in your house this morning. And we're thankful for the son that you sent to die on the cross be buried and rise again so that we can have eternal life. God, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, I would pray that today they come down and God, that they would accept the free gift that you've offered all of us. I bless the invitation now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.